This is the fifth estate winning headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you might have missed this morning. But we also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 18th of September 2020 and I am 2J. I'm Tuam. And I am GK. In case you missed the headlines, here they are. In the Daily Nation, COVID curve, danger in the good news. Mm. In the Standard, Ryla's new plan to flatten Ruto curve. And in the Star, Kinati and Wanjigi in fierce gun battle. I suspect we begin with something out of a Hollywood scene. So many interesting headlines today. Yes, let's begin with the star. The star, Kinoti and Wanjigi in fierce gun battle. Now, the first thing you, saw, you would have thought if you saw this headline is that Kinoti and Wanjigi was, were actually shooting at each other. Yeah, mm. face to face mm -hmm. at it. Yes, yeah. face to face. But the truth of matter is this. Jimmy Wanjigi has gone to court demanding that the DCI be compelled to release his firearms. Police say that he had no ju justification to arm to arm himself as a country enjoyed relative peace there. I have two things to say here. Look, the first thing, I don't think it's upon the police to say when someone should or should not arm themselves <laughs> because it's, a, it's provided uh, within the law. Mm -hmm. But also as but well. But it's not a right. Yeah, it's, not a, it's not a right that you have the I, gun. I said I had two things to say. Okay. <laughs> the second thing I want to say is, look, if someone has military grade weapons in mm -hmm. his possession, yeah. I don't think that they should be in possession of those guns because then they should they would be a danger to themselves and others. And then lastly as well. I thought you had two points. Uh, no, that is point two two B. <laughs> now uh, point two B is every single weapon belongs to the state. Right? Ultimately. Ultimately. Now uh, the businessman can <coughs> go to court and say whatever he wants to say. But uh, if uh, Kinoti wants to keep his, uh, his guns, I think mm. it's uh, well unfair. Yes. yes, and what I take issue with is he's not the only gun holder going through such a process. Mm. Um, Matiangi came out, I think it was last year, and said that people have to go through fresh vetting yeah. um, for anyone who is a gun license holder. So he should also submit himself uh, to, the same. to the same processes. Mm -hmm. um, all I'll say to Anjigi is welcome to us mere mortals who rely <laughs> on state protection yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, you know, but, but again, I think uh, what shocked me in this story yeah. was the nature of yeah. his weapons. Yes. I yeah. think that it's one thing to have, you know, a normal firearm, but yes. to have military grade weapons sitting in your house. And it's not just one, it's a couple yes. of them. Yes. Absolutely. That's quite terrifying. But I think remember before the handshake, things were tenuous. But, but, yeah, but, but, but I think that if we look at the United States as a huge lesson for what not to do, yeah. I don't think we want to ever, you know, fall to their level of, you of know, military of, 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 of misuse of guns. It's but also, scary. let's remember this. I would also not trust the star to give us this headline. You see, very they, good point. They, they, they make it look like there was an actual gun, sh uh, gun shootout. Fight, yeah. end, a shootout. But also, as well, I mean, if you sell 4,000 copies of a newspaper every single day, <laughs> you'd want to have the most sensational yeah. headline out there. That's and true. my question with the headline was who's benefiting from this? Does one jiggy want us to feel pity? For him, I don't Good. think it's the star that's messing up people's. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. guys, we have a three-part criteria that we will use to break down the headlines. We ask ourselves: Is it topical or speculative? Is it repetitive or groundbreaking? And is it thoughtful or just plain lazy? <laughs> it is both speculative. Mm -hmm. And it's in be in between that spectrum of thoughtful and lazy. And it's almost reckless. Yeah, yeah. So can we toss it based on that? Oh yes. There you have it. Tossing mm -hmm. the star. Let us move to the standard, where Ryla's new plan to flatten Ruto curve, mm. I will give this to the standard, a good play on words given the pandemic times that we are living in. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that uh, ODM um, leader Ryla Odinga is about to you know, go on overdrive with his um, yeah. campaigns yeah. in a bid to checkmate the deputy president. Yeah. Um, so he's going to do countrywide rallies where he's building momentum for the BBI. Yeah. Mm. Um, and he's going on this Trump offensive mm. to sort of restore his his popularity and, mm. and all that yeah. um yeah i think this isn't new mm -hmm. uh we we all knew that as the kenya opens up um and the restrictions lift the political rallies are gonna yeah. pick up again pick up pick again up. Yeah. Yes. i will say this yeah. for bbi to work as yeah. they go out campaigning yeah. um the majority must be persuaded Mm. by the idea yes. um, that what they are proposing in BBI is better than any conceivable sort of alternative. So yeah. I think it's important to go out there to educate mm -hmm. the citizenry on why BBI will be good for them. Yeah, yeah. And if Ruto is going to oppose it, he should also then come up with his own alternative. Alternative, I know, not just making noise. And exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, Chike, I completely agree with that. I think it's about time that uh, Raila took to the streets. Absolutely. I think one of the biggest grievances the country has had with BBI yeah. is the fact that they don't entirely understand what 
what it, it is about, what it's about. Exactly. And so I think if Ryla can go out there and in the way that Baba Man can do, yeah. is explain to the people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, break it down, what yeah. it is. It'll yeah. be great. And here's some food for thought as those people who will sit in the audiences and watch these campaigns go on. Wear a mask. The, <laughs> wear a, a, wear a mask. <laughs> Try to social distance. T three, the fact that so many successful <laughs> politicians are such shameless liars is a reflection of not only them, but us. Yeah. So when the people want the impossible, yeah. only liars can satisfy them. So let's also get real. Let's start to be realistic about real our talk. acts and yeah. what they can actually give us. Very good. Shall we move to the Daily Nation? Yes. Daily Nation, COVID curve, danger in the good news. So I think we've all realized that the number of <laughs> daily cases has begun to reduce. Mm. And I think a lot of people have taken that to mean that we have, in fact, started to flatten the curve um, and that things should start beginning to well, maybe we'll return to normalcy, but the Daily Nation is telling us that there is danger in the good news and within good reason. They tell us that um, 18 of the 47 counties have reported at least a 50% rise in COVID cases between August 18th and September 16th. So that's mm. just very recent. Yeah. And they say that a lot of these counties are having, um, they're registering fewer cases but more consistently yeah mm. so where previously you may have a case on monday wednesday friday now you're having more uh, fewer cases but more frequently mm. monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday okay. and i think that it is cause for concern the uk mm. began to see um emerging of the flattening of the curve now mm. they're dealing with a second wave okay mm. so i think as kenyans we sh let's not forget what moment we're actually living in as okay. I said before, wear your masks. Yeah, wear your masks. Um, I didn't actually understand what danger in the good news meant. So can we... Very fast. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> I did not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> your commentary was very uh, good, but the <laughs> headline you. itself a little All right, toss it. Yeah. <laughs> can we give Standard uh, the winning headline? Ryder's new plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like it. There you go. Yeah. On to the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country, where we also have a three-part criteria. We will ask ourselves, is it humorous or dry? Is it satirical or pessimistic and is it effective or just plain lazy? You have Let us begin with... It's the Ndula, the Daily Nation. And there you have a chairman of Council of Governors, Operanya. And he's been uh, blocked out by smoke. white smoke. And behind him is <coughs> a caricature of uh, Mukomen, uh, Mutula Kilonzo Jr., Chirogei and Wetangula. And Mukomen saying white smoke finally. Mm. And uh, Sakaja is the one who opened the door. Uh, of the Senate door so that the smoke can hit the, the chairman of COG. Now look... Uh, this cartoon is wrong in the first place because the person who broke the deal for this is none other than Uhuru Kenyatta. And not Sakaja. And, and Raila Odinga, no. <laughs> look, these guys have Uhuru tried... was not on the floor of Senate. <laughs> well, well, look, this Sakaja and these fellows that have been drawn here have tried 12 times to mm. get this thing uh, to pass at yeah. Senate, but they have not. And there have been accusations of bribery from uh, uh, from many quarters. And uh, if these guys had the will and the guts to do it, they should have done it much earlier. Mm -hmm. They had to be they had to be chaperoned by a state house and be told, listen, guys, if you don't do this, there will be a shutdown. Yeah. However, uh, big big picture, yeah. right? Regardless of who did what, I think big picture is we finally have an agreement, and I think mm. that's the most important thing. People can kind of move that, on. That's mm. true, but they must remember who their master is. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, let's park Good that. cartoon, yeah. yeah. Let's park it. Uh, right. In the standard, we have the Donald. Yes. And he's saying, make America great again sounds better. But he's trying to read um, he's a doing chart. An he's yeah, doing, an doing an eye test. test. And the chart says, structural racism in America. <laughs> mm. I think the point here is that Trump just cannot see what's going on in his own country, so he's going to see what he wants to see. Trump will win the next coming election. Take it from me. You can go to a, to a bank and ask for a loan, <laughs> and uh, I can guarantee that for you. Okay, whoever wants to do that, maybe. Can we toss the standard? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think standard. that's a. The star, Ozone, you have a drawing of the Senate and caricature of Uhuru Kenyatta and Rela Odinga holding each other's, uh, is it arms or what? Yeah, brothers and in arms. Yeah, bro shoulder bro to shoulder. Bro brothers in arms. Who's um, angry in the back? I cannot tell who Clear that of is. Us. Clear of us? No, it's a weekly of Operanya. It's weekly of Operanya. Ah, okay. It's Sorry. a few. At last, we have a formula. Mm. Now, the star, uh, Ozon has gone to right. The people who uh, broke this deal is none other than Uhuru Kenyatta. And uh, let me tell you, 50 billion shillings is not, so 50 billion shillings is not small money. Plus 316 billion shillings. That was a deal breaker for goodness mm. sake. These uh, funny team Kenya guys who wear Kenyan uh, ties. <laughs> 
uh, they had been compromised before and uh, therefore someone their father had to come and sort them out and uh, <laughs> sell them how to do politics. I want to say just two things. The yeah. first is I was quite shocked to see that none of the headlines covered the success of the CRA formula passing. Mm. And I think it just proves that in this country if it's not um, interesting, yeah, yes. if, no, I mean if it's not interesting, if it's not sexy, if it's not like violent, yeah. they don't want to cover it. They won't give it airtime. Yeah. Yes. And the second thing is this ozone ndula thing. Can we go back to that? With the white smoke. Are they the same person? Are you so the, the same person? The idea of the white smoke comes from the choosing of the Pope in the Vatican. Yeah. So when a uh, Pope has passed away and they're choosing a new Pope, um, as they go through the decision-making process, if the smoke out of the chimney comes out black, it means that they have not agreed on a new Pope. Mm. Once it comes out white, it means that they have agreed on a new Pope. And I think yeah. that's what they're both referencing. Okay, so, so of the white smoke cartoons, who gets it? Uh, this uh, ozone. Ozone? The star. Okay. We, it, it wins. Okay. Because yes. of Huru. There yeah, you yeah, have yeah, it. it <laughs> the star gives us our winning country. And now for our final thought, but before we get there, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And now our final thought. It is inspired by a book entitled What We Owe Iraq, or oh, Iraq, as the Bozungos <laughs> would call it, War and Ethics of Nation Building mm -hmm. by Noah Feldman. Nice. Before we get there, can I give a summary of the week? Go ahead. Thank you. So this week we explored what it takes to build a nation. Mm. We took examples from various countries around the world and we asked ourselves, you know, should it dri be driven purely by the state? Yeah. Uh, what role do citizens have in nation building? And what are the ethics around foreign intervention when it comes to nation building? Mm. So on Monday, we started with The Beginner's Guide to Nation Building by Dobbins, Ch Jones, Crane and DeGrasse. And this was a practical how-to <coughs> manual on the conduct of effective nation building. And they proposed that it should be organized around the constituent elements that make up any nation building mission. And these are military, police, rule of law, humanitarian relief, governance, economic stabilization, democratization and development. Mm -hmm. And the chapters described how each of these components should be organized and employed and how much is likely to be needed and the likely cost. And here we asked, is nationhood to be created or to be found? Is it evolutionary or rather than revolutionary? Mm -hmm. And on Tuesday, we moved to Venezuela, where we read a book called Crude Nation, How Oil Riches Ruined Venezuela by Raul Galagos. And here we looked at how oil affected the behavior of both state and citizen. Mm. We explored how oil has destabilized government um, and life for its citizens, and how state-owned enterprises have compromised how markets have run. We saw how government has fixed uh, the percentage of profit that any company can earn. And here, the nation builders um, put in place a sort of failed socialist regime that allowed the very rich elites to continue to get richer at the expense of the majority. We also learned about mango management, where a citizen threw a mango at her president to get her needs heard. Yeah. <laughs> On Wednesday, we went to Russia. We looked at a book called The Lost Kingdom, a history of Russian nationalism from Ivan the Great to Vladimir Putin by Sahi Plokhi. And this is a wide ranging history of Russian nationalism that looked at how Russia has yearned to grow an empire and how, how this has affected its politics for centuries. It chronicles how in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea and attempted to seize a portion of Ukraine while the world watched in outrage. And this violation of the national sovereignty was in fact only the latest iteration of a centuries long effort to expand Russian boundaries. Mm. Uh, Ploki shows how leaders from Ivan the Terrible to Joseph Stalin to Putin have exploited existing forms of identity, warfare, and territorial expansion to achieve imperial supremacy. Mm -hmm. And on Thursday, we went to Burkina Faso and we looked at Thomas Sankara Speaks, a collection of his speeches from 1983 to 1987. And this was a fascinating in-depth look at Sankara, where he instituted radical changes to our country when he came to power. He dared us to invent our future as Africans. He lived his anti-corruption message famously trading in his government Mercedes for a Renault. Mm -hmm. And he was a fiery and colorful speaker. There's a real historical value and enduring inspiration in a close reading of many of these speeches. Sankara was a good wordsmith, and it's easy to, easy to see how two generations of Africans um, continue to be an admiration of his um, oratory skills. Mm. We dedicated this book to our local leaders <laughs> uh, who have been verbally chaotic and full <laughs> of empty rhetoric. Yeah. And it's the weekend, so now we're moving to Iraq. You know, yeah. G GK, uh, we know you went to a group of schools when you say Burkina Faso. <laughs> what should it be? Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso. It sounds like you're saying I also say Murkomen. Murkomen. <laughs> and Turkana. Burkina Faso. Oh, Lord. Anyway, Moving today, on. yeah, normally we keep it light on a Friday, but I think that uh, <laughs> it was only apt to end the week with a look at Iraq. Yeah. 
And so I think more than 18 years um, after the United States invaded Iraq and almost eight years after the country's withdrawal or semi-withdrawal, the question of how Iraq fell so far and who should be blamed for that collapse has been asked, but it hasn't necessarily been answered in a very whole way. Mm. And so in this book, Noah Feldman takes a look at the role that the United States played in the failed nation building of Iraq. Yeah. So he argues that to prevent nation building from turning into this paternalistic and colonialist charade, we really need to find a new humble approach. And I think that's very important and very key. Mm. Nation builders should focus on providing security without arrogantly claiming any special expertise about how successful, successful nation building should take place. But I still think the question should be asked, what went so wrong? And going back to the title of this book, what does the US actually owe Iraq, if anything? And so the author begins by proposing an account of why the US actually in, um, engaged in nation building in Iraq mm. and how it differed from earlier iterations of American na um, nation building efforts. And so he goes first to the Cold War. And he said that during the Cold War, we had what was known as MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. Mm. And this ensured that no country was crazy enough to strike the other. And I think that's what ke kept the Cold War a Cold War, mm. because it would lead to sure death on either side. And so from the outset, the American objective in nation building after World War II was to create a rich, stable, independent, but also capital driven mm. independent states in order to strengthen the American alliance against the Soviet Union. Yeah. And so the objective was to create nations that would take the American side in the global war and ultimately be useful to the US. Yeah. And so the author says that is a complete shift to what we see today. He says, with the Cold War behind us, the American objective of nation building is not to gain allies in a global war because mm. we're no longer in a state of war, whether cold or hot. Mm. Yeah. He says the objective has to become um, building states whose own citizens will not destroy the U.S. itself. Mm. So it's become more um, of a defense for yeah. the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And he suggests that the new threat isn't destruction by ballistic missiles that we used to see back in the 60s, but more so it's um, trying to avoid destruction by terrorism. He says terror terrorism is the new frontier. Yeah. And he says terrorist leaders are more brazen than, more, uh, than presidents, for example. Mm. They're ready to die for a cause. Al-Shabaab, for example, they're ready to die for their um, extreme Islamist um, you know ideals yeah. there's no accountability when al-shabaab does something there's no UN or ICC to turn and wag a finger in their face yeah. and if you cut off the head of one leader another will pop up mm. and so this makes them very confident to carry out their aims in their belief mm. and so he argues that strong countries strong and very large quotations strong countries like the US or uh, the West in general mm -hmm. Um, it's in their interest to build nations, to engage in nation um, building, yeah. because these failed states will ultimately provide a threat to them. Yeah. I find that very strange, a very Self odd concept. Yeah. And I think that it's very arrogant and ignorant, because nation buildings, if you look at the US's track record, you have Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Mali, um, Syria. Yeah. These, they've created more you know, deeper divides, deeper conflicts mm -hmm. than were ever existing before. And they yeah. actually initiated many of those issues. In Iraq, for example, the US was known to disregard advice from experts when mm. they said that the um, weapons of mass destruction existed with Saddam Hussein mm. we know today that that was completely false yeah. Yeah. but they were so focused on their own agenda and ideas that that's what they um, the narrative that they wanted to pursue yeah. and it's been claimed as unanimous for example that the Iraqis desperately want reconstruction of their country but they say that the US has consistently failed to provide them with the opportunities and a framework to succeed mm. so we ask again that question yeah. Actually, what does the US owe Iraq? And yeah. I think it's quite what are the a big deal. Around that? Yeah. yeah, so it's interesting because a distinctive feature of nation building is this idea that, you know, um, you're trying to create legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So in chapter three of the book, um, they focus a lot on elections, which again is a very um, West, it's a, it's a Western view. Mm. Uh, the idea that elections equals democracy. And if you have elections, then you, you know, it's a tick for, you know, you're doing democratic things, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so he says that Iraq, um, the way the um, regime collapsed in Iraq was not an internal collapse per se. It was by overwhelming military force. Mm. Now in the, in the 
effort to then build a nation, they couldn't just have an election immediately. Absolutely. And so the idea there is to produce conditions suitable for democratic elections without initially holding those elections. Mm. And the idea there is to create that background, to say that whoever, if we put the processes and the structures in place, whoever emerges as a leader will be legitimate. Yeah. Now this can go wrong, and we have seen this go wrong in places like South Sudan. Mm. So you saw that um, you know they, they signed the peace process, and then they're told that they have to have an election in, you know, in five years or something like that. Mm. And in the scramble to try and hold these elections, the country just disintegrated. Mm. Uh, coups against themselves, all sorts of things. And sometimes you have to think, should these things be spontaneous? Should yeah. they be for enforced from you know, outside. the outside? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why you're seeing so, so some of those failures happen. Yeah. So the author does make um, a qualification. He says, too much has been made of the redemptive power of elections mm. and too little of their capacity to check the arbitrary exercise of power. So beginning with non-elective consultative structures, nation builders should try to establish mechanisms of responsiveness to popular sentiment in countries being built. Yes. So I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Now he says also the timing of elections is very important. But two, he says elections do two things well. One, they provide large scale accountabilities because elections answer the question, is the government overall doing a good enough job from my perspective to deserve to remain in power? Mm. Right? So in 20, well, not 2022, but mm. in, in the 2013 <laughs> election and the 2017 election, you asked yourselves those questions. You said, mm. should they continue to remain? And the answer was yes. And the answer was yes, so they remained. And two, elections reveal public preferences about whose views, very generally speaking, ought to be followed in government. And so the analogy here is to a marketplace, which does a better job than any other mechanism in revealing the important information of who values which goods and at what price mm. um, so that you know that the the primacy the you will vote for who is most important to you mm. absolutely uh, so it was interesting it was very interesting very look there is no way no absolute way that the United States of America at any one time can speak about ethical national building and I say this because of this look Americans have intervened in many countries before, yeah, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, but all those countries went past. Mm -hmm. But then again, I also want to cut them some slack. You see, he says, if a new illegitimate government takes power in a coup, it may be tempting to support it because of, uh, because for purposes of stability and security. But then that would be inappropriate and imprudent. Mm. And that I agree. And then he also says something that I agree, but I also find it a little bit suspicious. He mm. says, ultimately, however, because uh, he says that uh, ultimately, however, because the nation builder is not apparent and the nation that has been built, not a child, mm. the bond of ethical obligation does break when full sovereignty has been achieved. Mm. Nations Fantastic. must yeah. at some stage take responsibility for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, that is good on uh, for one occasion, absolutely. If, South, if uh, the Sudan, for example, Khartoum, there is a coup there, I don't think countries around it should, be, should interfere, mm. right? Uh, if they have mechanisms, to ensure that the coup goes as planned or not as planned, I think that should be left to them. Mm, yeah. But then, what basis, or rather on what basis, do the Americans have to come and say, if the Americans have interfered in Iraq or Afghanistan, and then for about three, four years, and then they leave and then they say, okay, maybe we should leave that part to you. To figure it out. To figure yeah. it out. When they are the when ones who already, initiated. <laughs> it means they have messed that place up and they want to leave it because they cannot sort it out. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, look, I, I want to speak about the example of Libya. By the time Gaddafi, and I've spoken about this uh, for some time. By the time Gaddafi uh, was uh, being deposed, mm. Libya had the highest GDP per capita in Africa, yeah. mm. highest uh, life expectancy in Africa. Mm -hmm. By the time the Americans did what they did in Libya, by the time Obama, and this is on Obama's uh, shoes, by the time Obama did what he did on Libya, 60, uh, Libya lost 67, 66.7% of its GDP in just one year. Mm. All right? Now, Libya is a hotbed of terror. CNN always calls us Apparently. about it. They have sev over 700 militias, and that's because of one man who just could not use his head. Yeah. Now, uh, point is this. I think if, if the Americans want to get uh, involved in other countries, uh, number one, that is wrong, all right, because it's not within their purview. Countries should be left to decide their own problems. And maybe that's why I will support Trump. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, what? 
a vote for Trump from Kevin. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so on the day where we had a winning headline from the standard and a winning cartoon from the star, I want to leave you with this. Our revolution is not a public speaking tournament. Our revolution is not a battle of fine phrases. Um, our revolution is and should continue to be the collective effort of revolutionaries to transform reality, to improve the concrete situation of the masses of our country. Now, we are not going through a revolution, but nation building and improvement is about this. Mm. So have a lovely weekend. Uh, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, but also find us on TV. We're on GoTV, uh, Pankita, and Spotify.